the last video that I published was uh, it, it, it used uh, the story of a pilot, SAA pilot, who almost, well, he was one of two pilots at the helm at the time, who almost crashed an international flight that was rescued only by the intervention, if you like, of the, um, uh, the automatic pilot, autopilot. And I have another story now to do with flying. It's the very next video. It is genuine coincidence. I happen to remember that at the time that I got these two stories, it was quite a coincidence that they should be one after another. Um, yeah, <clears throat> that I should receive them one after another. This is months ago now, six, seven months ago. But there were stories that I didn't cover at the time and I'm um, cleaning up some stuff and, and throwing away a lot of stuff, but also making a few videos of things that were that have some kind of moral to them, some kind of they're worth that there, there is some moral to them that is as relevant now as it was then, even if the the plot of the story is not topical anymore. The moral or the theme is still has value so it's just by coincidence that i'm doing two saa or, or airline type stories in close proximity in quick succession this also appeared in the citizen also written by one hein kaiser pilots left to fend for themselves as airspace controls were switched off at the weekend. This means that beyond onboard instrumentation, no ground radar support from air traffic control was available to aid the separation of aircraft. Last weekend, South African airspace, this was, gee, the date doesn't appear here, but it would have been in, in March of last year or the first weekend in April. The weekend in question. Last weekend, South African airspace could have ended up like a typical day on Joburg's roads. Instead of traffic lights being out of order and absent pointsmen, airspace controls were switched off. Pilots flying in the affected regions were on their own. A notice to pilots was issued last Saturday by Air Traffic and Navigation Services which controls South African airspace, saying parts of the country's skies have been downgraded to class G. This means that beyond onboard instrumentation, no ground radar support from air traffic control was available to aid the airplanes. It's beyond your imagination. You know, I'm one of those people who says that every chance should have been given or should be given to black people to do as well for themselves as they can. Let people succeed and fail on their merits. You will never guarantee outcomes, equal outcomes. It just doesn't work that way. But what you can do is grant people fair opportunity. Therefore, when the new South Africa began, I was one of those people who, although I had deep misgivings, and within five years, in fact, it was at the time of the second cabinet, a particular event happened. The Mail and Guardian wrote about the new cabinet, the second cabinet of South African government following the 1994 elections. And they gave a bit of attention to where the various cabinet ministers came from. Excuse me. And I noticed that there was a tremendous bias toward people from uh, the Eastern Cape. Also people. And I went and did some research on South African demographics to get a better understanding of how great was this imbalance, how disproportionate to the demographics 
were the numbers of Kosa people in the second cabinet, the Tabo Megi cabinet. And I then spoke to a black woman who's uh, very, 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 very uh, well connected to the highest echelons of the African National Congress. And I said to her, you know, I don't know, you know, if you don't know, I'm just asking, you know, but, and she said, because there would have been a revolution if, if, these are not her exact words, but I think I'm true to the spirit of what she was saying. If we'd been egalitarian, if we treated every tribe equally, in spite of the fact that the Kosa people, she is not a Kosa, in spite of the fact that the Kosa people had come to dominate the upper echelons of the African National Congress, there would have been a revolution. Those people wanted theirs and they wanted it now. And there would be no such thing as non-tribalism. You remember that? Non-racism, non-sexism, non-tribalism, non-racism, non-sexism, non-tribalism, non-racism. You remember that? Huh? She said the non-tribalism thing just simply couldn't be afforded. And my point is that at that point in time, I came to realize that this thing is going one way. That there were too many signs. There was too much of a, a stink, a smell in the nostrils for, for it to be as for the new South Africa, for the Rainbow Nation, for the African National, for the new South Africa made in the image of the African National Congress. For the, for the new South Africa state made by virtue of deployed cardership, very much in the image of the Nas African National Congress. For it to be as, as benevolent and beneficent as they made it out to be. Nevertheless, I was always happy for people to prove themselves and to do their best. And um, I once worked for a company that had, at one stage, 332 staff. And I, I began there in a very lonely, lowly position. And uh, after a couple of years, got a tremendous tremendous promotion and I went from literally literally like staff member in the hierarchy staff member number I don't know 320 seriously all of the black technicians were senior to me up to staff member maybe number 10 or 12 it was a phenomenal promotion for which I shall always be grateful. Thank you, Offer. <clears throat> That's the man's name. Um, and where I was leaving the shop floor to go into the senior position behind a desk, hunched over a computer, using this rather than this, Some of the black guys approached me. And one guy had tears in his eyes. And he said, we, um, we just want to say thank you to you for being the best of all of the white guys that we work with. And I said, oh, it's, it's no problem. He said, no, no, no uh, please, you know, don't, don't, he didn't use these exact words, but don't chase us away. Don't dismiss, dismiss us. We really... We're very, very grateful to you because you were always willing to show us and to help us to learn and to share your knowledge. And he said something like, we've learned more from you alone than all of the others put together. And fairly big staff working in that one confined environment over, under literally one roof, one enormous roof in Bears Valley in Johannesburg, Judith's Paul. I said, okay, I accept your thanks. I wish you everything of the best. 
my point being not that I'm saying that really it's just to allay or dismiss the suggestion that some people might be leaping to that I yeah I, I, I know what's in my heart and I know that I have a huge degree of sympathy for people and I don't get a kick out of making twits of these people. I do it because it is germane to my circumstances, the futures of my children, and to everything that I know and love. End of story. Clark. These idiots have had their chance to do any good. When I was a kid, I read a lot, a lot, lot. And I remember that sometimes I get books and this, this was in Let's say, I was born in 1971, so let's say by the age of 10, 11, 12, we, weren't, we had to come home. We weren't allowed to not be at home. There's none of that rubbish, you know, in my parents' eyes. So, I couldn't like, go do things by myself, but on my way to school and on my way from school, my mom didn't mind if I popped in at the library by myself as long as I was quick, quick, and I got home by whatever time. And so I started getting books from the library, but not, not uh, borrowing. Uh, the, the librarians would give them to me. Books that were donated, they'd say, just have them. Now, I was a, I was a, a, I was a serious reader, <clears throat> and they obviously appreciated it old-fashioned librarians, you know, I was like a protege. <coughs> I loved the fact that this little 9, 10, 11 year old boy was reading so seriously. And I remember in those, that, so we're talking now about uh, 1980, 81, 82, 83, getting books that may have been printed in the late 60s or the 70s, where they would say, uh, for instance, I'm making this up. Macmillan and Sons, New York, London, Johannesburg. Penguin Books. Again, I'm making it up. Uh, uh, New York, London, Sydney, Johannesburg. And I distinctly recall how, with time, that became less and less and less and less and less. As South Africa became greater pariahs, international publishers no longer wanted to boast about having a prestigious office in Johannesburg. Or, simultaneous to that, you remember the, the difficulties of the late 70s and the 80s, as our economy was not quite so dynamic as it had been, and as international sanctions began to really uh, kick in, some of those satellite offices of those global publishers may have closed down. Excuse me. And my point is that you compare that prestige, you compare the prestige of the dollar costing 50 South African cents. You compare the prestige of all the world champions that we had at the time. All of those things. And you say to yourself, okay, ANC. All right, the ANC can slip up a little bit here or there. We understand that. We get it. But level G? Level, level, level G. Level G. Downgraded to level G. A. B, C, I know what letter of the alphabet it is, because it's the seventh row on a chessboard, but let's go through the exercise. A, B, C, D, E, 
if G downgraded that much. Because presumably there was a time in South Africa when nothing less than level A would do. At least level B. Hey, call it C. E, uh, D, E, F, G. Guys, I put it to you very nicely. If you're watching this video and you do not yet appreciate why Saitlanders is relevant to the future of this country, there is something wrong with you because it means that you can't see the obvious, namely that this country is in a terminal decline and that terminal decline must terminate in a collision. A terminal decline with a terminal collision. And very, very little will save you from that terminal collision, except a national emergency plan devoted to the purposes of safeguarding the welfare of our people, which we are allowed to do under international law. The Geneva Conventions and the protocols additional to the Geneva Conventions make specific provision for identifiable ethnic groups to prepare for a threat in legal manners. In other words, we can't buy nuclear-powered submarines. We can't buy uh, 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 aircraft carriers and jets. and We can't do illegal things with illegal firearms and explosives. and But we can prepare to defend ourselves with the light arms that we possess. It says so in black and white. We can huddle together behind a hill. We can make no-go zones. We can improvise to ensure that our women folk and our children are less exposed to harm in a time of absolute crisis than they might otherwise have been. I'm telling you, and you may mark my words, that within the next six months, videos like this are going to become more and more and more relevant as people see what is the actuality of the ESCOM crisis, of the impending, impending is not even the right word, the advancing food shortages, which if you don't know about them yet, then again I say to you, not with hatred, but that there's something wrong with you. There's something wrong with you. If you go to work at Vaxmont's attorneys in Santon every day, and somehow it has eluded you, or you've actually eluded it, that there is a global food shortage evolving, developing, coming out, emerging. And it is going to strike South Africa very hard. And we could talk uh, about ESCOM and we can talk about inflation. There is, a, there is an inflation problem in South Africa at the moment. We could talk about budget shortages and reserve bank issues and this and that, the next thing. But just a few salient things should be enough for you. Such as the story, which maybe you didn't know, but now you do. And if you listen to the story that I, I did publish before this one, the story on the, uh, the guy who almost crashed the uh, Boeing jumbo jet, being promoted to the head of training at South African Airways. It, now you know that. Now you can't. Oh, nobody told me. No, I didn't know it. Oh, oh man, why didn't nobody tell me? Those excuses are rapidly, rapidly being exhausted. Anyway, guys, I'm not going to give you any more, any more of a hard time. I sincerely, from my heart, wish you the best. May our Lord bless and keep you in the dim times that lie ahead of us.
God bless you. Bye-bye.